want to close by summing up uh, some sense of where I think we are and where we're going. Our goal is to understand the economics of time-varying risk premiums and their connection to macroeconomics. Uh, the goal is not to produce smaller alphas than HML, SMB, or, or the other um, finance uh, factor pricing models. And this is a common mistake. People will do a, some sort of consumption-based model and then compare it to the Fama French model and say, we got smaller alphas. That's not the point. As, as you saw with the equity premium, the point is to understand why the factor risk premiums are what they are. Why is the HML premium so big? Not, uh, can we find something that explains the 25 better than HML itself? But that's hard. We have barely touched on why the market premium is as large as it is. Well, what is the macroeconomics of the HML premium, the macroeconomics of the S&B premium, the macroeconomics of the momentum premium? Uh, that is the, the question for us to understand. And why do these premiums vary over time? Uh, are they associated with business cycles or what economic events are people truly afraid of? Where we've been is, is we started with the power utility function. Uh, and we looked at a bunch of other utility functions. And one way of, of encompassing what we've done is, is we added non-separabilities. Uh, if a utility function is separable, that means you can express utility of consumption and lag consumption or leisure or something else as a, as a sum of the two utility functions. And the key there is that the marginal utility of consumption doesn't depend on the level of x. Uh, what we did was we, we changed that assumption. We said that utility is, is a function of C and X, uh, consumption and past consumption in the habits case, uh, consumption and leisure in some other work, um, in a way that is not separable. So when I take the, the marginal utility of consumption is affected by this other thing X. And, and the simple argument here, when U sub C, just take the derivative, when the marginal utility of consumption is affected by this other thing x, you have another factor. That's an easy ingredient for bringing some other factor in. Oh, maybe people aren't scared of consumption growth. They're scared of this other factor x. We'll just make it non-separable in the utility function. Or in discrete time, that leads to consumption to one power and this other thing to another power. You can see why that sort of structure kept coming up over and over again. What's been done across goods, leisure, uh, houses, um, uh, uh, across time, past consumption in the form of habits or durables, across states of nature. The uh, recursive utility basically said that we, th the standard utility function is a sum of utility of different states. So marginal utility of one state doesn't affect marginal utility of another state. That in a deep way, the recursive utility is changing that, that assumption. A another challenge, uh, I haven't talked at all about behavioral finance. Uh, but that's the idea that, that the utility function itself is wrong. That, that we need, uh, if we look at expected utility, sum of probabilities times utilities, we're looking in the wrong place. The problem isn't the utility function. The problem is that people's assessments of probabilities are wrong. The, the difficulty, of course, is that in every asset pricing formula, pi and u go in together. So uh, it, you need, you need a, a psychological theory. You need to somehow separate, is the pi that's going wrong? Or is it the U that's going wrong? Other changes, uh, um, we, we, rather than just change the utility function, we saw two examples of keeping the utility function, but changing the market structure. Uh, so uh, in one case, uh, with full, the, the, the assumption of full insurance. And if you look at the, the assumptions of our model, rationality of the investor may not be the, the most obvious thing that's wrong, but the assumption that all risks are fully insured and consumption moves in lockstep. Well, maybe that's the one that's wrong. I showed you two examples. Uh, idiosyncratic risk, the, uh, the idea that, that uh, we each get risks that aren't insured in asset markets, and how that can interact with nonlinearity of utility functions uh, to produce aggregate effect. I also showed you how even if uh, people are perfectly insured, different utility functions, changes in wealth across people with different uh, utility functions, can produce the effect that we're looking at. We looked at the production side, uh, uh, how, how producers uh, should react to risk premium by investing more. If every time the market price goes up, there were no adjustment costs, producers would supply so much capital that the price would always be the same. Uh, so, so answering that production side response is important. And that leads us to the road of general equilibrium models, 
which I, uh, I, I haven't reviewed a specific example. There are many, and, and, and there's a lot of work going on them. Now, there's a whole other branch of how should we approach this problem, which has become increasingly popular since the financial uh, crisis. I'll call them segmented markets, narrowly held risks, consumptions of intermediaries or consumptions of stockholders, institutional finance uh, or frictions. Uh, as we look to the, the institutional structure of the finance industry, uh, most of us aren't sitting in our terminals every day buying or selling stocks, and lots of people don't hold uh, stocks at all. I made this drawing in uh, discount rates to, to give a sense of the intermediary finance view of the world. The fundamental investors give their assets to intermediaries to buy and sell on their behalf, and they split those for some reason into equity and debt tranches, so that the intermediary, when the intermediary starts, a leverage intermediary, when the intermediary starts losing money, the intermediary gets scared, even though the fundamental investors aren't getting scared. So you can see what's happening here is that the, the utility function, the, the, the problem of the intermediary is what's driving asset prices, at least at high frequencies, not anything that's happening to the fundamental investors. The red line is attempted to capture, well, why not? Uh, that means that there's a wedge. These people would like to buy securities, and they seem not to. So an interesting question for this class of theories is, how long can that uh, wedge between what investors want and what securities do last? Why don't we find new institutions to, to get there? But this whole class of theories is, is a big thing that's going on as an alternative to utility functions, um, uh, investor market structure, uh, or production to understand why securities prices go up and down, especially uh, in the finance from, uh, uh, financial crisis. And I'll, I'll, I'll close with trading and information. Uh, it is amazing. All, all the models you've seen so far uh, make the prediction that trading is zero or trading is irrelevant. And yet the markets that we see have an enormous amount of trading. This is a, a final graph from um, an old paper and reproduced in discount rates. And what I'm showing you here is the prices in the NASDAQ tech, NASDAQ and NYSE through the tech boom, along with the trading volume in NASDAQ tech, NASDAQ uh, and, um, and the NYSE. And you can see that high prices correspond to huge volumes of trading. Now we've taken that as saying, well, uh, this is to be explained by macroeconomics and for some reason people like to buy and sell a lot, uh, but perhaps causality runs the other way or at least backward and forward. Perhaps something about the mechanism of bringing information into prices uh, does affect the level of prices, at, at least in the short run. So those are some wild, new, and different ideas uh, about uh, how we explain variations in prices and, and consequent variations of expected returns. So that's our big puzzle. Why are people scared to hold stocks? Why is the equity premium sit there and people don't, don't invest more in stocks? Why are people more scared to hold stocks at some times than other times? Why do stock prices fluctuate? We know that corresponds to expected returns, but why do they leave those expected returns on the table? Why don't they invest more in stocks overall and especially when prices are low? Why, why didn't all of us, I only wish that in March 2009 at the, at the absolute buying opportunity of a lifetime, I had put more money in stocks as you should wish that. Why didn't we? Why were we scared? What is the right measure of good times and bad times? The discount factor. Does it come from utility, from production, from market structure, from segmentation, from, from the institutional structure of markets? There's a whole lot for us to do, which is a great thing. Mm -hmm.